Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, today, I'm going to talk about JavaScript debugging and go over some uh, tools and techniques that we use to figure out what's going on in our JavaScript code. Oh, my name's Jim Gorgudis. I'm a senior web developer on the search team, just so you know who I am. Um, like I said, the things that we're going to talk about today are some browser-specific tools, some generalized tools, um, some common situations or pitfalls you might find yourself in as you're debugging your code. Um, and then we'll actually get into the nuts and bolts of actually using a debugger. Um, Browser-specific tools. Um, there's basically different tools available for each flavor of browser. Um, in my opinion or my experience, um, IE 6 and 7 um, kind of have the, the worst tool set available for debugging JavaScript. Um, Microsoft Script Debugger, Microsoft Script Editor, Microsoft Visual Studio um, are the common tools that we use for IE 6 and 7, and they're not very integrated, well integrated into the actual browser. Um, so they're a little more difficult to use, and I'll, I'll get into that in, in later slides. Um, there is a an add-on toolbar called IE Developer Toolbar that's really, really handy, but unfortunately it doesn't do anything for JavaScript. So it's really great for CSS hacking um, or inspecting DOM or clearing cache or stuff like that, but it doesn't do anything for JavaScript. Um, IE 8 is leaps and bounds better because there's actually um, developer tools built into IE 8, um, and you can kind of cheat to debug IE 7 because you can run IE 8 in IE 7 mode, so it kind of sort of behaves like IE 7. Um, it's not 100% reliable in the sense that it doesn't, from a, from a JavaScript standpoint, doesn't behave exactly like IE 7, but for a quick and dirty check, it's often close enough. Um, Safari has built-in tools called Web Inspector. Um, Chrome has developer tools and a JavaScript console, which have become really robust. Um, and Firefox has the ever-popular Firebug, which is kind of the, the, the main gun in our arsenal. Um, like I said, so Internet Explorer 6 and 7. Um, these don't have any JavaScript debugging enabled out of the box. They're geared towards consumers, um, so they basically swallow any JavaScript errors. Um, so to be able to see what's going on, you have to go into the, the properties or the settings, depending on what flavor of operating system you're on, and enable a couple of checkboxes for display a notification of every script error. Um, you have to turn on JavaScript debugging. It's, you, you kind of have to dive under the hood and, and, and enable this stuff. Um, the tools that I mentioned before, Script Debugger, Script Editor, Visual Studio, are separate downloads. They're actually additional apps you have to download. Um, and you have to start them up kind of to run alongside the browser. Um, like I said, it's not, very, it's not at all integrated into the browser, so they're, they're just kind of clunky and a pain to use. Um, I talked about IE Dev Toolbar already. Um, it's handy, but it doesn't do anything for JavaScript. Um, and then the final thing about these tools, or I should say IE 6 and 7, IE 6 and 7 in general, um, is there's no easy way to disable JavaScript while you're working on a page. And this is useful for um, doing things like um, fallback cases to handle situations when JavaScript is disabled. Um, we often do this for testing SEO or testing accessibility or graceful degradation, stuff like that. Um, so this is kind of what things look like when you enable debugging in Internet Explorer 6 and 7. Um, you, you get an alert window um, that kind of generically gives you an error that says, object doesn't support this property or method, line 15, um, and you click yes. Um, and this is what Microsoft Script Debugger looks like after you click yes on that alert. Um, it points to something. We, maybe that's line 15. There's no line numbers here. Um, this looks like an editor, but it's not. Um, so you can't really do a whole lot with this. You kind of have to visually guess and say, does this syntax look OK? Um, and then go back and edit your code in your other editor and reload and all that fun stuff. Um, yeah, please use the mic if you, if you don't mind. Or, yeah. How long are we supporting IE6? Um, 
IE6 is, I think, officially not a tier one browser anymore, but IE7 is. Um, and unfortunately, this debugging situation um, covers IE7 also. But as I said, IE8 has an IE7 mode, so we can sometimes bypass using or work around this problem, debugging things in IE8, running in IE7 mode. Um, IE8 um, has tools built into the browser. Um, they're easy to, to set up. You just go into tools, click on developer tools. Um, you get a full DOM inspector and a JS debugger and profiler. Um, as I mentioned, it runs in an IE7 mode, so that's really helpful. And you can disable JavaScript on the fly, so it's a simple toggle to shut off JavaScript. Um, in contrast to the IE7 situation, this is what things look like in IE8. You have a full um, set of tools integrated tightly into the browser. Um, you can actually debug and step through and set breakpoints. You have a console. Um, you can see your code right here. You have a command line where you can run script, run your script. Um, so it's a lot, it's a greatly improved situation. Um, Safari <coughs> is also has tools built into the browser. Um, they're simple to set up. You just go into preferences, click advance, click show develop menu. Um, you get a full DOM inspector, a JS debugger. You get a network panel and a uh, full JavaScript console. Um, and again, you can, you can disable JavaScript under the developer menu, so that's handy. Um, this is what Safari looks like. Um, it's pretty similar overall to all, the, all these in-browser in tools are fairly similar to one another. Um, you have code on the left. You have kind of expressions or a console on the right. Safari puts their console at the bottom. Um, and you can see we get error messages in the console. Um, and there's also a prompt here where you can actually type code and run code or evaluate code right in the browser. Um, Chrome also has tools built into the browser. Um, you go into View, Developer, Developer Tools. They work pretty similar to, to Safari's. Um, you get a DOM inspector, a network panel, um, a JavaScript debugger, and a console. Um, the latest versions of Chrome can do some really powerful things like edit code um, right in the browser. Um, you can pretty print the code. So what that means is if you have JavaScript code that's like in production and it's, it's minified, it's compressed, you can actually click a button and it will uncompress it um, to make it a little more easy to, easy to work with, which is a really, really powerful thing because it means you can debug production code, um, which otherwise is impossible to do. Um, unfortunately, Chrome, at least the last time I checked, you can't disable JavaScript on the fly. Um, I think you have to go into deep in a menu or deep into a configuration setting and click something. Um, it's not just a simple keystroke. Um, this is what Chrome looks like. Um, again, there's code on the left. There's a call stack, watch expressions, breakpoints, and stuff on the right. You have a console and a prompt at the bottom. This is very, very similar to Safari's. Um, and you have. Uh, Console tab up here, um, and I think Chrome calls their network timeline right there. Um, finally, Firefox has the ever popular Firebug. Um, it's not built into the browser, but it's an easy to add-on extension. Um, you can get it from getfirebug.com. You can open up the add-ons control, the add-ons um, manager in Firebug and, and grab it that way. Um, you can enable it via tools, Firebug, open Firebug, although most recent editions of Firebug, once you install it, you actually get a button in the upper right-hand corner of the, of the browser that you can just click on. Um, it, again, gives you a console profiler, debugger, and a full network panel. You can disable JavaScript on the fly. Um, and it's currently, in my opinion, the best option. It's kind of the de facto tool that most people use, although Chrome is a really, really close second these days because Chrome, is, Chrome has iterated really fast on, on their tool set. Um, yeah, so this is what Firebug looks like. We start off with um, the console panel, um, which gives you console output. It gives you uh, a prompt at the bottom where you can enter in code. Um, you can actually shift the size of this console using, I think it's that button, which will give you a larger console, a larger prompt where you can type in big blocks of code and execute them. Um, and then there's a script tab. There's a network tab that shows all the things like HTTP requests and AJAX requests and requests for other JavaScript files show up in that. Um, and so this is what um, the script panel looks like. We have code on the left. Um, we have a 
watch stack and breakpoints on the right. There's no breakpoint set yet. You also see that there's an actual error that's shown down here when there is a problem in the code. Um, some general tools we can use when all of the above aren't available to us or, or if you're working in some esoteric browser that just doesn't have tools. Um, this is what we did 10 years ago. Uh, you use the JavaScript alert um, command to just, broad, to just cause alert boxes to pop up in the browser. And we would scatter these things throughout the code um, and figure out how far the code would actually execute before it failed. So you'd put you know, a half dozen alert statements in your code um, and figure out you know, if the first three fails, you know your failure point is somewhere after your third alert. Um, you can also use console.log, which is a JavaScript method to print to the um, JavaScript console in browsers that have them. So basically anything um, Firefox, Safari, and Chrome support console. I think Safari or IE8 does, but IE7 does not. Um, some other tools are things like JSLint. JSLint isn't a browser-based tool. It's a website where you can upload um, JavaScript files or JavaScript code. Um, and it will scan the, the syntax of the code and, and reveal any errors in the code. So this doesn't evaluate, this doesn't execute your code, it just examines the code. But it's often useful for finding small syntactical errors um, like missing semicolons or things like that that you would not really catch visually. Um, YUI Logger is a tool set from the YUI library that actually gives you a console-like container that you can plug into your web page and write commands to. So it has, it has like a, a log command that works very similar to console.log. So if you're in, for example, Internet Explorer and you don't have console available to you, you could um, plug in the YUI logger utility and use and, and, and log statements out to that. It's, you know, it's work to set up, but once you have it, it's pretty handy. Um, and finally, there's, there's something called Firebug Lite. Um, which is kind of a, 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 a slimmed down version of Firebug that you can run in any browser um, by including a, a, a JavaScript file. Um, I don't think it gives you like a full JavaScript debugger profile, but again, it's something that you can use to kind of exam examine your code or print messages to. Um, some common things that you might find as you're working in JavaScript code that might, you know, that, that can result in hours of hair pulling or, or frustration are things like suppressed errors. Um, some um, websites or some pieces of JavaScript actually suppress error messages. And you can do that simply by setting window.onError to an empty function. Um, and no errors will show up in your, in your code at all. This is useful to do in a production environment where you don't want your users to see JavaScript problems. But in a development environment, it's obviously very problematic because things aren't working. You have no idea why. Um, so that's something to always check for if you're not seeing something work and you're not seeing any errors as well. Um, we don't do this here at LinkedIn, to my knowledge. But I know like we used to do this at Yahoo um, you know, um, for good reason. But it was something that we had to remember to disable in, in the development environment. Um, and something that I've run into more recently is um, you may have heard things like Douglas Crockford is fond of saying eval is evil. Um, but there's a, there's a method in JavaScript called eval that lets you basically convert strings of text into live JavaScript code. Um, errors in that, in that parsed JavaScript code um, don't really show up in the browser the same way um, kind of native errors do. Um, you'll get this weird error message from the eval method, but not from the actual code. So there's no corresponding line numbers, um, and it's really, really hard to find where the problem actually is. So that's something else to keep in mind of. Um, as I said before, when your code's compressed or minified, it's basically, you know, you spend all this time writing easy to read code, everything's tab, tab indented properly or tab aligned properly, but then when it goes to production, it gets compressed and it gets scrunched down into one big long line of text. Um, if there's an error in you know, line 1256 on your development box, that same error will be on line one at you know, the 10,000th character, um, and it will be impossible to find in a, debu in a debugger. Um, the thing that I mentioned before about Chrome having that pretty print method, or that pretty print function, 
um, which unpacks minified code or compressed code, makes basically uh, uh, moots, makes this problem moot. So it's kind of a powerful thing. It's kind of a new thing too. But basically, debugging minified code is really, really hard. Um, this is why when you like grab jQuery, for example, there'll be a version of jQuery that's jQuery, you know, 1.7.js, and there's also a version 1.7.min.js. You want to run the minified version in production, but you want to develop with the unminified version so that you can find, you can step through it and find out what's going on in it. Um, another kind of bugaboo is in Internet Explorer, if you have an array, um, or an, I should say an object, um, or an array, um, like var config, foo is something, bar is something, baz is something. Um, IE is very intolerant of what we call trailing commas. So you can see, uh, where's my cursor? So this little comma right here will wreak havoc in IE. Um, uh, I think IE 6, 7, and 8. I don't know if 9 is better or not. Um, this will cause all sorts of crazy errors in your browser, and it's just a, a stupid comma. Um, things like the JS lint that I was talking about before really, really help to reveal small little syntactical errors that could take hours to find. Um, something else that's not really prevalent because most of the time we work with libraries like jQuery or YUI, but conflicting AJAX requests can happen. Um, if you're writing native JavaScript code to do AJAX requests and you have multiple asynchronous AJAX requests, it's possible for the second request to actually conflict with Sorry, the second response to conflict with the first request. Um, so you might get data back that's not what you're expecting. Um, and you can use the network panel um, that I mentioned before in browsers that have it to kind of figure out what requests are being made when and what responses are coming back when. Um, that's kind of a useful tip. Um, so we've talked about kind of the different tools available. Um, now we'll actually get into the nuts and bolts of how we actually use a debugger. Um, basically, you, this, it's, it's pretty simple. You run your code in a browser. Um, you see if the browser reports any kind of errors. Um, if there's errors, you open up the, the, the tool like Firebug or Chrome Developer Tools. Um, you, usually, the, if, if you're lucky enough, the browser will tell you the line number of the script that the code, that the code bug is on, and you can set a breakpoint there. Um, you can rerun the script, and it'll actually stop at the breakpoint. And you can inspect the, the values of the variables that are at that breakpoint and figure out if you know, your Boolean is true when it should be false, or false when it should be true, or if you're looping properly, or whatever. Um, you can step through your code. Um, you can actually test. A technique that I find very helpful is you can actually test chunks of code in that command line prompt um, to make sure that they're doing the right things. If you're trying to like um, sniff for a DOM element, and you're using a, a, a sizzle selector, you can actually test that right there to make sure you're getting back that, the DOM element you expect. Um, and then you fix your code in your separate IDE or TextMate or whatever you're using, and rerun everything and see if it works. Um, so Firebug specifically, again, um, I mentioned setting breakpoints. So you do that just by clicking in the left-hand column. You'll get a big red dot. Um, these controls at the top right of this left-hand panel are basically play, step in, step over, and step out. If you've used any kind of um, code debuggers, it's probably pretty similar. Um, this um, step into a, a, a method call or a function call, um, step over th the next method call or function call, and step out. That's what those refer to. And I'll show some examples. Um, so I had originally done this presentation last year as kind of an interactive workshop. But due to the size of the group and the fact that we're streaming, that's not really practical. So I'm going to I'm going to basically go into an exercise myself and then ask you guys questions about it. Um, so before I do that, some further reading. I apologize that these are light blue. It's um, because I clicked on all these links already. Whoops. This is some further further reading if you're more interested, if you're curious about learning more about debugging. Um, Alyssa Part has some great articles. Um, the Microsoft Developer Network has some um, uh, instructions and, and good tips about how to install and use 
things like Visual Studio and Microsoft um, Script Debugger and Script Editor, um, some random blog posts. Um, Mozilla.org is a great resource. Um, WebMonkey.com has um, JavaScript debugging for beginners. Uh, so let me switch over to our, our example. Um, Um, so the question was, if you're debugging in, in a browser and you're at a breakpoint, what's the context? Um, if you're using breakpoints, the context, you get the context of your program. So if you're in an object, um, the, the this keyword in JavaScript will represent the object. You, you, or I, I should say you're, you're in the same scope. Um, if you're just using the console, um, typing in arbitrary strings of JavaScript to, to evaluate, um, you're at the window scope. Um, so that's a, a, a really good point to, uh, to mention. Um, and that's what I think, that's one of the things that make breakpoints really powerful, is you can actually stop your program execution, inspect all the variables in the, in the proper context. If they're not behaving the way that you think they should, you can actually go to the console, and if you type of the same variable name, it'll, the values will be, will, It'll have the same values, and you can actually manipulate those variables um, and see what's going on, and try to make corrections right there before you actually go back and edit your code in your editor. So the the, the follow-up question was: If you use the console to change variable values at a breakpoint, does it stick? Yes, yes. Um, so you could, you know, you could completely blow away the context of an object and wreck your program, which is the caveat, but yes. Um, if a Boolean needs to be false and for some reason it's true, you can actually change it at the breakpoint um, and then continue executing and it, for then on, will be, will be the new value. Um, so the thing that I wanted to demo real fast was what debugging in IE7 looks like. I have an IE7 VM. Um, running on my computer right now. Um, so I have this one of the exercises that I'm going to talk. I'm going to show. And if I reload this page, you can see the browser's loading. And I did already turn on debugging um, through the the preference settings I talked about before. So you can see we get this, a runtime error has occurred. Do you wish to debug? Line 12, error expected, semicolon. Um, I've already installed um, Microsoft Script Debugger, um, which isn't the best of the three choices I mentioned for IE, but it was the one that I was able to find a download link for. Um, so if we click yes and wait. So here's Script Debugger opening up, and it dropped the cursor at this line, uh, which I'm assuming is line, I don't, it doesn't even, oh, line 13. It does say line 13 right here. I was wrong before. Um, and something's wrong here, but we don't know exactly what. Um, I can't edit this. File is read-only. Um, there is a debug button up here that I think you can use to step through the code somehow. Um, honestly, it's been a while since I've used this, so I'm a little rusty. Yeah, it, it's kind of hard to use. Um, in contrast, if I go to something like Firefox um, and run the same exercise, um, I'm not seeing, hang on one second.
Hmm. Okay. I'm not seeing any errors, but if I, I have Firebug installed, and as I mentioned, um, once you install Firebug, you get this nice button now um, that you can just click to get Firebug. So if I rerun this exercise, I'm in the console panel, so you can see we get an actually a much, much more helpful um, message. We say missing, um, missing semicolon after for loop condition on line two. So I can go click on this, um, and unfortunately it opens up jQuery, which is minified, um, which, as I mentioned before, it's really hard to debug. But if I go back to console, um, I can click on this arrow and get a little more information about what's going on. Um, I can click on the code itself and get taken somewhere, but this isn't actually where the error is. It's not, it's not in the jQuery library. Um, if we go to Chrome and look at the same problem, again, I'm not getting any error messages, but if I go to uh, the JavaScript console. Um, I get this error that says uncon syntax error, expected identifier. Um, and it's saying it's on line 13 of this JSIMG HTML file, which is the file in our browser. So if I click on that, um, it's telling me that there's an expected identifier in line 13. So something is wrong with this for loop. Um, I can set a breakpoint here. Oh, I have to go to scripts. Um, actually, let me go back to Firebug because I'm a little more efficient in Firebug. So if I go to script, I can pick not showing me the source of the file itself. That's odd. Okay. Oh, I bet I know why. I loaded this as a file, not as, an, as a web document. Darn it. Okay, hang on one second. Not still doing the same thing. This is odd. I apologize for this. This is I didn't expect this to happen. Yes, um, I'm trying to set a breakpoint on that line, but the browser's not letting me get to the code that's in the HTML file. Which is not something that I have seen happen before. Um, well, yeah, so I was going to ask what you recommended to do. This is the source of the JSIMG file that we were just looking at in the browser. Um, and, oh wait, this one's not the right sort of file, darn it.
Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, so, right, there's a missing semicolon here. So if I fix that and save it and go back to my browser, let's see what happens now. Okay, so here's my script. So now we're not getting any JavaScript errors, but we're not getting anything on the page either. Um, what do you guys think we should do next? <coughs> OK. Um, so if I put a breakpoint, say, like at this for, for loop, actually, let me put one here. Um, and refresh the page. The code stops somewhere. Okay, so now we're stopped at our breakpoint. Um, I is one. J is undefined. Does that look right? J shouldn't be undefined, right? J should be something. So let's go back here and try var j equals 0 and reload the page. OK. Why is j equal to 50? Hmm. So now we can step into this block of code. Oh, sorry, that was step over. Um, two, two, zero, and zero. And now we're stepping through this inner for loop. If I get rid of this breakpoint and let that code execute, it's still not doing anything correctly. Um, let's see if we can figure out what else is going on. If anyone has any suggestions, feel free to call out. Yeah. In your lower for loop? Uh huh. Um, you go only when i is greater than 50 rather than when it's less than 50. Okay. OK, so good. Um, so he said that in the lower for loop, um, it looks like the lower for loop only executes when i is down here. Ah. All right, so it looks like this for loop doesn't execute because i is never greater than 50, right? OK, so the, the comment was that it, sometimes it's useful to view the generated source to see what the JavaScript is actually writing into the page. So we can try that in a second. Um, let's look and see what happens if we change this. Still not getting anything. So this is how we view generated source. This isn't a firebugism per se. 
Um, this is just something that the browser makes available. Um, it doesn't look like, oh, there they are. The divs are at the top. So we're getting ID of I0, J0, I0, J1, I0, J2, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing in the divs, no. Let's go back and look at the code. Okay, the comment was, let's try putting something in line 14 just to see if we get um, Oh, in the div, okay. Okay, so now we're getting output in our divs. What did you say about get color? Okay, the comment was it looks like we're not actually finding the elements to add the CSS. Um, so let's go to let's go look at get color in our in our um, in our debugger and see what's going on. If we go down to get color and put a breakpoint here and refresh this, and step to it. Um, so get color. I is 50 and J is 50. Opacity is 100%. So 50, 50, 50, 50, and opacity is 100%. Um, J is 50 and I is 50. That seems a little strange. Sorry? Uh, I recall from an earlier conversation that all variables have functions built uh -huh. or something in JavaScript. So you're not necessarily, I and J aren't necessarily going out of scope because the preceding for loop uh, that you've exited it. Uh, yeah, I know, but I have no idea what's going on. Here. So the, the, the comment or the question was something about a functional scope. Um, and whether I or J, I and J have, I, the I and J and get color have um, kind of the correct scope or are in the correct scope because we're out of, we're out of the loop. It's interesting that your breakpoint first caught for values of I and J that the for loop this is apparently wrapped in should never generate. Right. So the, co the comment was that it, it was interesting that the breakpoint stopped. Um, for values of i and j that should never happen because i and j should always be less than 50. Um, you're getting, you're warm. Um, right. Was there a question over here? Um, so the loop should, I and J should, inside the loop, I and J should never reach 50 because these, are, these aren't less than or equals. They're less thans. Um, but um, the comment before was, was, was warm. So notice that it says that get color is an asynchronous call. Um, what that means is get color happens um, not, in, not, not in sync. Um, What's actually happening here is, and I'll I'll just I'll give you guys a hint because we're we're running close to the hour. Yeah, go ahead. Because it's getting called too late. Um, kind of, yeah. Um, I've actually worked through this exercise once, but it was a few weeks ago, so it's not fresh in my head. And I kind of did that on purpose because I wanted us to work through this together. Um, whoops, sorry about that. 
Yeah. Um, so if I recall correctly, what's happening here is um, get color essentially has a delay in it. Um, get color is defined in a separate file, so we don't actually have we don't actually know what's going on inside that file. I mean, we can take a look at it if if we want to, but. Um, we know that it's asynchronous, so it happens later. So you're kind of right that it's happening too late or later on. So by the time get color happens, or by the time this, this code executes, I and J are 50. Um, and furthermore, because get color's inside these loops, um, get color should fire once per loop or once per inner for loop, but because it happens asynchronously and it happens later, um, I and J each time through the loop get clobbered by the next value. So I and J are, are zero or one or whatever through the loop, but by the time get color happens, um, I and J have been clobbered and they're all 50. This is, this is an example of functional scope in JavaScript, which is exactly what you were talking about. Um, so the way we need to fix this, um, if I remember correctly, um, is something like, we can try to put an anonymous function here to create a new scope. Um, we want to self-execute it. So let's try that. Let me turn off this breakpoint so that we can run the code. Okay, that didn't fix the problem. All right, thanks. It's still not getting us what we need. So let's try something else. Go ahead. Uh, question? Yeah. Can you like the code for a second? Sure. Uh, I'm not super familiar with this function that or the solution for for getting my ID on link, but there's a pound sign in that ID. Mm -hmm. uh, is that appropriate? Yes. That that's the selector for an ID. Okay. So let's try something else. Um, let me get rid of this closure that I've created. Um, and change everything back to I and J. So one of the things I talked about before was JSLint. I actually have JSLint plugged into this editor. So I'm going to try running it um, and see what it tells me. So there's a missing semicolon somewhere here. That's not a huge problem. Uh, there's a redeclaration of I. That's not a huge problem. And a redeclaration of J. Again, that's not a huge problem.
what I wanted to do is look at this, this get color function. Um, which it's all encrypted, so we can't do anything there. Hmm. Okay. Does anyone have any other suggestions? Kiro. Okay, try that. Sorry, did you have a question too? That? So the question is, what is opacity? Um, that's a good question. What? By get color? Pass them in here. Yes, yeah. Do they also go here too? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So that's that's actually best practice to have IMJ as a sync, but IMJ just going inside that anonymous function expression are going to point to the arguments, not to the outside. Right. So what Kiro said was that INJ now point to the outside scope rather than and, and these guys are in the 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 values inside this closure, this functional closure, have their own, have a different scope. So let's try this. Sorry? That should have worked. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, watch. Sure. So watch lets you just arbitrarily type in um, variables that you want to check out. So for example, um, I'm not sure if this will work, but we could type in opacity. Um, and it's not, it's not defined. Right. If I go into here and put a breakpoint here inside this function um, and rerun things, um, you can see that opacity is now 60%. So that's, th that's what gets passed in. It's a way of... of kind of listing out variables you want to keep an eye on rather than consistent constantly having to go back and hover over ho hover over them at a breakpoint. So i's and j's are 0 and 1. Um, if I step so it's here here's another example of watching so I can do watch i and watch j. Um, and if I step or if I run again um, I is 0, J is 16, 2 and 17, 0 and 15. So yeah, something's getting clobbered. Kiro. Oh no, I took that out. I took the sample text out. Yeah. 
So that's that's. So the question was, is there a way to to, to check the selector expression to make sure that it's we're, we're actually getting something back out of the DOM, um, and we can totally do that. Um, if I rerun the page, oh, I didn't turn my breakpoint back on. Um, so we're stopped at our breakpoint. I can just copy and paste this. So this is a jQuery selector. Um, and if I go to the console and paste it, um, I and J should be in scope. So you can see we get this div back. So it is finding something. No, I didn't. So that's that's an interesting bug. So note that this says um, opacity is a value between zero and one. We saw that the opacity before was sixty percent. So that doesn't seem right. Um, so let's try this. Let's, um, let's try that. And then it was 60, and we want it to be 0.6. So let's divide it by 100. Uh, now we're getting somewhere. So I can test this using console again. And I get 0.6. So now I'm getting values between 0 and 1. Um, if this is 100%, it's 1. So that, that looks right. Um, Let me remove this. Sorry? OK, so we found another bug in the HTML code that's actually, this is class name. It should just be class. Not really JavaScript, but that's a good eye. And I had forgotten about that, so thanks. OK, so now we're getting something. Um, but it's kind of not exactly right. Um, and I know what the trick is, so in the interest of time, I will just fix it. Nope, that wasn't it. I don't think it was that. Darn it. No, it is. 
You're right. That's what I meant to do. Thanks. There we go. So that's what this is supposed to look like. So you can see that this is kind of an arduous process. Um, and if the bugs aren't simple syntactical bugs, if they're logic bugs, it can take a while to figure them out, um, especially in unfamiliar code. But this is actually um, an exercise that Jacob Hauser, one of our web developers, came up with for, as an interview question. Um, and it's a pretty good one because it shows, it, it reveals um, proficiency at using a debugger for JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. Um, and I thought it was a really good example to use here. Which it took a little longer than I thought. I apologize for that. But you can see you know, it's a really good exercise of, of a debugger. Um, that's pretty much my presentation. Does anyone have any questions about debugging in general? Nope. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>